This is Greg Locke. He's a hate preacher who famously does insane stuff regularly. Like last year, he held a book burning at his church. Well, he just announced he's holding another. This is part three. If you haven't seen the others, don't sweat it. This stands independently of the rest. I'll explain context if it's missing. In the last one, he announced the next book burning. In this one, he goes off on this weird tangent about how he's convinced the Illuminati is coming for him. Seriously, it gets bizarre. Let's watch. You are miserable and blaming God because you tried to open a locked door and you kept knocking, 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 knocking. When God shuts the door, go to a next one. But when God opens the door, jump through it. And he opens another one, jump through it, opens another one, jump through it. You walk through the doors that God opens, but you do not knock on a door that God has closed. Am I making sense? That'll help you with a job. That'll help you in a marriage. That'll help you with your kids. That'll help you with financial decisions. Listen, any decision you need to make, if God opens the door, walk through it. If God closes the door, quit messing with it. Oh, that, that's fascinating. So just right off the bat, the very first thing that I'm thinking right now is... This is making people way more susceptible to scams. God opens a door for you. Didn't somebody message you the other day saying that they wanted to invest your money for you and all you got to do is start out with a seed of $5,000? God opened that door. Walk through it. The advice Greg Locke is giving to his parishioners is piss poor. And I really hope they don't follow it. It's honestly sad that he and his members, churchgoers or whatever, buy the garbage that he says. Quit messing with it. And 90% of the Christians that we counsel and deal with in deliverance ministry have been beaten on a locked door and never walked through the open ones. You got an open door right to your left. You got an open door right to your right. But Wait, is it to your right or to your left? <laughs> Which one is it? I don't understand. But you are so hell-bent on getting what you want. Like Jesus is a genie in a bottle. Let me in, 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 let me in. You keep on knocking, but you can't come in. Is that a song that I don't know of? Quit knocking on it. Just Never call Dear Greg, meth is not a good thing, right? I think I may have already mentioned that, but yeah, he, he was addicted to meth when he was younger, unfortunately, and I really think that he still is. Just leave the door shut and go through the one God open. Because it's like a... It's like a mesmerizing maze of life, right? You want to get through the maze? Then only walk through the doors that are open in front of you. And quit trying to beat your head and your hand and your heart against a door that God has clearly closed. This is sad. This is honestly sad. That, that's, that's simplistic, down-to-earth, pastoral shepherding 101, if I do say so myself. Also a good way to get your church members to fall for scams. And so the gate, whoop, open right in front of their very eyes. And watch this. And they went out and passed on through one street. And forthwith, the angel departed from him. Now, again, I'm giving you some principles that don't have to necessarily be like a, a doctrine. Okay, this is a, this is a principle, not a doctrine. It's a principle of life. God will only lead you so far in your walk until your personal responsibility has to take over and you got to go where he sends you. The angel only got him out of jail but didn't take him to the prayer meeting because the angel knew... Peter knows how to get to the prayer meeting himself. And some of you, God love you. But what do we say in the South? Bless your heart. That means fuck you, you're a stupid bitch. You want God to lead you every single step of the way when you already know what the next step is. God wants to test your levels of faith. Just because he opens a door for you does not mean he's going to kick you through it. The Lord will only take you so far. And, and can I say this? We, we, we believe this often, Old and New Testament. that This is a huge principle in church growth. This is a huge principle in your life. Many times the people that God uses to get you where you are are not at all the same people that God uses to get you where you're going. Not because they're bad people, but some people come to your life for a reason and some people come into your life for a season. And when the season's up, the reason's up. Wow, he's found a rhyme that he can use. That must mean he's a good pastor, right? 
And so he said, okay, this is as far as I'm going with you. He's probably not even the origins of that rhyme. You've got to finish the rest of the trip tonight yourself. And the angel departed from him, verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he's like, whoa, wow, wow that, that was real. <laughs> my, my goodness, that, that, that wasn't bad pizza. That wasn't just something that happened to me in the, in the jail and made me doze off. No, that, that, that was real. He came to himself. He snapped into himself. Watch what happens. He said, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel. Now, can I remind you what Hebrews chapter 1 says about angels? Because people get on to me all the time. Well, you know, you say spirit of this and spirit of that and spirit of this and spirit of that. You know what the Bible says about his angels? They are ministering spirits sent forth to them who are the heirs of salvation. You know what angels are? Spirits that minister to the people of God. Okay, I, so he's saying that angels are spirits that teach people about the Bible, I guess? This angel left and hath delivered me, good word, out of the hand of Herod. It, it, it wasn't the people that came down there and drug him out of jail. It was the angel that came and delivered him from the prison cell while the people of God were praying in earnest for God to show up. And God showed up while they were praying for him to show up. Am I making sense? Not really. I'm, I'm really not picking up on what he's putting down right now. And from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And so he was delivered from two things. Number one, what Herod wanted to do. And number two, what the people wanted Herod to do. They wanted to kill this man. This man was going to be made a public spectacle in the streets. Hang this man. Rip him apart. Saw him asunder. Stab him like you did James. Kill him. We want blood. We want blood. But God delivered him from the hand of Herod and from the expectation of all the Jews that were bloodthirsty mongrels. And might I say, it doesn't take you very long to figure out, we're almost to that peak of anger right now in this nation. They would assume the people that are the cog in the wheel just get in the streets, just run over them and be done with them. Get these low-down, sorry people out of our way so we can have our progressive new world order. Oh, my God. He's obsessed with the Illuminati coming after him and trying to take everything from him and blah, blah, blah. It's insane. Not on my watch. I'm going to be trouble to him the whole step of the way. I'm going to be a wart on their face the whole step of the way. I'm going to fight the beast system tooth and nail the whole step of the way. Every bit of it. And so the angel came, delivered him from these bloodthirsty mongrels. Verse 12. When he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. Where, watch this, many were gathered together praying. You see, that was what, can I use the term, fetched the angel. That was the very thing that called upon the name of the lord and god said let me send one of my ministering spirits to help you out and dude i have no idea what he's even talking about right now i feel like he's making absolutely no sense whatsoever this situation much like daniel you know why we get the phrase the daniel fast and we do it for 21 days you know daniel did not get the answer to his prayer on day 21 daniel got the answer to his prayer on day one but it took 21 days in the realm of spiritual warfare for it to get there because the enemy was trying to stop the open door that God clearly had opened before him. But when these people gathered together, much like in the same situation, there was an open heaven over them and they got a hold of God and they said, Lord, would you let Peter get out? He's our pastor. He's our friend. He's one of the apostles. He's anointed of God. Would you let Peter get out? And they prayed and they wept and they prayed and they wept and they prayed and they wept. And here's Peter in prison for the gospel. You know what I find interesting? This is a beautiful, beautiful analogy. And I don't have time to develop this. But you remember in John chapter 21, after Jesus was denied three times by Peter, and Jesus even said, hey, go and tell Peter also. He was reminding him, I forgive you. Uh, you've never gone too far. You'll never out the grace of God. And when Jesus showed up, Peter girded himself with a fisherman's coat and kind of hid himself. He threw himself in the water. Jesus said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Went through that whole deal. And this guy goes back and goes fishing, right? 
He's like, I'm done with I'm done with the ministry. I'm done with church. I'm done with God's people. I'm done with Jesus. I've sinned too much. I've failed too far. I've gone too far off the deep end. I'm just going to go fishing. You know what's interesting? After the day of Pentecost, Peter never went fishing again. I honestly have no idea what that has to do with anything or why anybody would care or anything at all. I feel like I missed like this huge piece of something because he's is he even saying anything that is like even mildly relevant at all? I don't understand what he's even trying to communicate. Like what's he even getting at here? Because when you get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't live your life for selfish gain anymore. You only live for the purpose of the kingdom. And that's truly when Peter went from fishing for fish to fishing for men. Once the I have some friends that like to fish for men. Radiant glory and power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit fell upon him. And now this man goes to jail for his faith which in just a few earlier chapters, he denied vehemently with cuss words three times. And this guy goes from cussing and denying Jesus to stand... Okay, he misunderstood what he meant by cursing. I don't think Peter swore about Jesus. I think what the Bible meant was he cursed his name. Like, Jesus, I don't even know the guy. No, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't think the Bible is saying that he literally said fuck jesus i hate jesus i don't think that's what it was about at all am i wrong somebody who knows the gospel better than me let me know i i think greg Locke is misunderstanding the whole point of that set of verses is it just me i think he's using grand eloquence to swindle them oh absolutely for sure yeah yeah totally agree on that greg is obsessed with going to jail yeah he is absolutely 100 percent. yeah that's what i thought i i don't i I think it said he cursed his name. That doesn't mean that he swore about him. It means he said, I want nothing to do with him. That's what, it, that's what I got from it. Standing up on a hickory stump on the day of Pentecost and preaching the greatest sermon that has ever fallen from the lips of a man. And we are here today as a direct result of the falling of the Holy Spirit through that message on the day of Pentecost. Because everything changes when the power of the Holy Spirit takes over your life. Everything changes. And so they're there gathered, they're praying. Now check this out, verse 13. Things are about to get strange but amazing. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate. Now this is the prayer meeting, they're in there praying. Peter knocked at the door of the gate. A damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. So a little Rhoda chick comes to the door, she hears somebody knocking. Little Rhoda chick. Fantastic. Knocking. Everybody's in there praying. Now check this out, verse 14. And when she knew Peter's voice, apparently they didn't have one of them little peephole thingamadeals, you know, for the DoorDash guy. No, no, no. I assume not. She, she heard his voice. I find it interesting. Sometimes I try to go to the store all incognito. Because every time he goes to the store, people, like, bash him and say, you're a piece of garbage, so he goes incognito. I wouldn't be surprised if he wore a mask when he went to the store. He should, probably, because he's not a very popular guy, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? I, I wear my glasses, and I got my hat on, you know, and I'm just kind of in there just do, doing, doing my deal. And I'll get talking to my wife, or I'll get to talk. It happens every week. I'll get talking to somebody, and they'll be like, oh, we recognize that voice. You're that troublemaker on Facebook. I'm like, yeah, I didn't want people to know I was that troublemaker on Facebook. That's why I got this hat and these glasses on. Your voice gave you away. Well, they obviously had heard the voice of Peter a number of times, right? It was a very recognizable, distinguishable voice. And when he's knocked at the door, she heard his voice, and she opened not the gate for gladness. Didn't seem like she was happy, but she was. She was so happy, she left him out there. She's like, oh, my goodness, that's Peter. I ain't going to open the door, but it is wonderful. God answered our prayer. Yeah, just leave. Okay, that's his, this person is stupid voice. I know that voice. He does that voice pretty frequently when he wants to act like someone's an idiot. Leave the answer on the porch. <laughs> That'll preach. She opened not the gate for gladness, but she ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Now watch this. And they said unto her, thou art mad. Now, this is so strange. But this is so relatable to where we are in the church. We pray for God to do the amazing and the spectacular, and when he does it, we doubt it. 
Get him out of prison, God. Get him out of prison, God. Get him out of prison, God. She runs back. She said, you ain't going to believe this. God got him out of prison. They're like, you crazy woman. Okay, I, I don't know what he's talking about. I feel like he's referring to a specific event, but I have no idea what event he would be referring to right now. Is he talking about, like, the January 6th rioters or something? They're not out of jail. I, I don't know. I have no idea what he's referring to right now. Well, what would even make us think that he's at the door? He's knocking right now. I heard the man's voice. Are you kidding? We ain't here praying God will get him out of prison. Don't mess with us. <laughs> they were in there begging God to do a work that he had already done, but they just going to keep praying about it. And some of you have been praying for 15 years over a work that God's already done. And God doesn't need to answer your prayer again because he already answered it, opened the door and said, walk through it. It's in your disobedience, not in God's disobedience. Wow. So <laughs> if uh, God doesn't answer your prayers, really, it's your fault. You're just not following his instructions that he cryptically supposedly gave you. And you keep praying about something that's on the door. Hello, 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 hello. Peter's knocking on the door trying to get in. And they're in there like, oh, would you let Peter out? Would you let Peter out? God said, I did let Peter out. Would you quit praying and do something? There comes a point when you get off your knees and do something. And so he's knocking at the door. And they're like, you, you mad woman. But, I like this, she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. Whew. Help me, Holy Ghost, church people ain't changed in all these years. <laughs> you convince them of one thing and they got to have something else to say. <laughs> he, he's out there. Well, okay, whatever. Okay, yeah, God answered his prayer, but really it's just an angel. It's just his spirit. It's not really him. They were praying that it was him. And it was. And then they denied it. Why do we do that? Lord, send your glory. Then he sends it and people get nervous. Dude, is, uh, is he referring to a specific situation here? Because I have no idea what he's referring to here. People pray for things and then God delivers it and then they don't thank him for it. What? What's he talking about? We say things like this. We believe there's power and authority in the name of Jesus. If you don't believe us, come tonight at 6 o'clock. And then somebody that's been coming to this church for 10 years shows up at 6 o'clock gets freaked out because they actually see there's power in the name of Jesus. And they're like, oh, i got to go to a safe church. You know how many years we prayed for revival, then God sends it, and then people don't like the answer? Well, that's not the revival I thought. I thought, you know, revival looked like getting a show on Fox News. That ain't revival. They're just as bad as the rest of them. Revival is when the glory of God falls and man can't explain his way out of the situation that God takes control over. And we got too many things happening in churches these days that man could explain. We got... Okay, hold on. Let, let, let me just step back like 10 seconds and listen to his definition of revival again. Revival is when the glory of God falls and man can't explain his way out of the situation that God takes control over. Okay, so man cannot explain his way out of the situation that God takes control over. I don't understand what he means by that. I'm trying to think of a situation in which that could apply, but I'm kind of at a loss here. I really don't get what he's trying to communicate. And we got too many things happening in churches these days that man could explain. We got so many things happening in church today that God does not even have to take part in and they would still happen. Am I making sense? No, not at all. I'm really trying here. I really am. I'm trying to be charitable and understand. I'm not getting this. I'm not understanding. Is it because I'd be willing to bet Greg Locke would say, it's because you're not a Christian. That's why you don't understand. What a cop out. Now, look, our church has not always been as alive and awakened. We ain't woke because woke is a joke, but awakened. He's always got to slip that garbage in, doesn't he? As it is now. So I get it. Some of y'all come from a dry, crusty church. I mean, it's just dry as cracker juice. and It's totally run by just a handful of people that have all the power, and they don't want that church to grow because when it outgrows them, it outgrows their power, and then other people get the power, and everybody wants the power. And so I get it. Some of you are from a church, you are super frustrated. 
But here's the problem. We're, we're praying for God to do something amazing. And we've prayed for years. Lord, don't let us be lukewarm. Let us be a last day's church. Let us be a remnant righteous fellowship. Let, let us be one of those churches that you call uh, a church that is worthy of your presence and of your glory. Lord, we want revival. And we prayed this stuff for years. And then God says, I believe you. Pow. And he gives it to us. And the internet goes crazy. And he gives it to... Okay, so it, wait. I think I'm starting to pick up on what he's putting down. Is he saying they prayed for more members in the church and God gave them more members and the internet goes crazy? Is that? I think that's what he's saying, right? And so now we've upped one on the devil, as it were. But let's just be honest. The place we're in in our church right now it's not only the best place we've ever been in, it's the most difficult place we've ever been in. And we've gone through some difficulty. Because we went from you not wanting to tell everybody who your pastor was because he supported Trump, right? We got past all that. Everybody's over that. Now it's like, uh. No, everyone is past that because he doesn't talk about Trump anymore, almost ever. Which is good, you know. A pastor encouraging people to take a political position or whatever is a bad thing or, or support a specific political candidate or whatever. That's bad. Not that what Greg Locke does is much better because he still talks about all the same political issues he always has. He just doesn't voice his support for Trump as loudly as he used to, basically. Uh, I don't know if I want to tell him what church I go to because we cast out devils. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? And I'm not castigating you. I'm not saying you're wicked and evil for that. I'm just saying that's the place that we're in right now. So he feels like he's being persecuted by other churches because he does exorcisms. Yeah, absolutely. The, the whole exorcism thing, that is his whole belief on exorcisms is unbiblical. That's why I had to put that very definitive and demonstrative statement out on Facebook the other day. Because I need to let these people know out there, I'm not preaching for them. I, I don't care about these guys over in East Tennessee that think we've lost our mind. That's why I, told, I said, look, if you call yourself my friend, but secretly you talk about me like I'm a clown, lose my number. You are a clown. I don't have time for these people. I know what I've seen. I know what God's done. I know by faith what God's going to do tonight in this tent. I know. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced it with my own body. I've heard it with my own ears. We've seen too much. We've seen too much. And so why would we apologize when God sent the answer banging on the front door? Oh, no, I'm opening the door. I'm going to let him come in. I don't understand all of it. I don't claim to understand all of it. I don't have to understand all of it. If the God you serve can be understood and explained with your three-pound brain, you don't serve the God I serve. My brain can't explain him. I can't comprehend him. So what he's saying is, I don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to explain what I believe or why I believe it. There is no explanation for why I believe what I believe. And that is part of my faith. I'm supposed to not be able to explain why I believe what I believe. If I could explain why I believe in God then there would be no reason to believe in God. That's what I'm picking up from this, right? So I, I'm still in rocking and reeling mode trying to figure out how I can catch up to the glory of the Lord. And I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to leave the answer standing on the front porch, knocking on the door when God clearly sent his answer in the form of Holy Spirit revival in deliverance ministry and setting people free and in healing and all of the... I, I'm just not... I. I I just can't go back to what was. And the question is, why would I? Why would I? Because what he's doing is unbiblical, and he's an extremist. Although, in fairness, he was an extremist before, too. He was an extremist before he, you know, went down this whole exercising demons road, so. You know, I still go to my little political rallies. Cute, yeah, nice, man, whatever. You know what I'm finding? If you'll deal with the demons, you get them principalities off a of region, you can clean that thing up politically. 
Huh? You can clean it up politically. And so I've had to switch gears a little bit. I don't care how many big dogs we rub shoulders with. I don't care. You have to understand, then people no longer impress me. I used to think that was cool. I could pull up my cell phone right now and some of you would like salivate. <gasps> He's got that person's number. Yep, it's a number just like yours. Just like yours. Yeah, Greg Locke is very well connected. Although he does talk a lot of shit about a lot of people. Like Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen talks shit about them constantly. Oh my God, he hates those two guys. Uh, among others. Pretty much any televangelist, basically. He, he cannot stand them. Which is funny, because he himself is a televangelist. I suspect he talks to Donald Trump. That's just, I don't know for sure. It's just something that I, I suspect. Those people aren't nearly as cool as you think they are. Agreed, agreed. No reason to revere anybody in any kind of position of power or any kind of, you know, public figure of any sort. No reason for it. People in positions of public influence are no different than anybody else. Nothing special about them. They're not, like, amazing or extra smart. They're just as smart as anybody else. No reason to revere them. Now, there's some amazing people, some godly people. Now, some of them I wouldn't spit on if they caught fire in the parking lot. But every bucket sits in his own bottom, and everybody puts their socks on one foot at a time just like everybody else. 100% agree with him on this point. Wow. Actually kind of surprised he's saying this. Absolutely. Everyone puts their... I, I love how he uses the phrase, everybody puts their sock on one foot at a time. Is that what he said? Because the saying is actually, people put their pants on one leg at a time, and that's simply not true. I put my, leg, my pants on two legs at a time. I sit on my bed. Put two legs in each leg of the pant. That's how I do it. So I feel like one foot at a time for socks is more accurate. Just like everybody else. There's only one phone call that I always take without fail, no matter who I'm with. Donald Trump, his wife. No, he's going to say God, of course. He's going to answer God's call. And guess what? It's not yours. It's hers. Oh, it's his way. Okay. I thought he was going to use a cliche, but I guess not. Isn't that the truth? I've been with some of the biggest political dignitaries on the planet, and my wife's picture will pop up on my phone. They can be mid sense. I'll be like, halt. Hello, darling. How are you, my love? Right? You know, they've only been together for, I don't know, a few years. It, it, he, he has kids. With another woman. He got divorced. I think he's been divorced three times or twice, maybe. I don't remember how many. A minimum of once, either way, because Ty Locke is a, a, a new wife that he's got now. I remember when he like went through his divorce and people were criticizing him for it and stuff a while back. She's the coolest phone number I've got in my phone. Okay. He's obviously trying to get something tonight. Rest of people don't impress me. That's why you have to understand I'm in such a different place now as the, as the leader of this church. I'm accountable to this church. I'm accountable to the gospel. I'm accountable to the word of God. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to let criticism from people that I wouldn't even ask their opinion bother me. Let that word help you. Don't let somebody's criticism bother you if they're not somebody that you would ever ask their opinion of to begin with. If you would never ask their opinion on or off of Facebook, then don't worry about their criticism. Agreed. Because if you wouldn't ask for their wisdom, then apparently you don't think they've got very much, and so don't worry about it when they get mad, because guess what? They're going to get mad when you don't ask their opinion. And that's just where we are in our church. And so I'm just saying... I. We've got to open the door for what God's doing. We can't just go back. We can't just leave the answer on the door. Knocking, knocking, knocking. So just keep rolling. We're about done. But Peter, verse 16, continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I don't know why. They had an all-night prayer meeting praying that this would take place. I mean, maybe they should have been a little bit spiritually shocked. Yeah, I get that. But now they're astonished. Oh, my goodness. We can't believe that God actually did what God said he was going to do. Don't let that shock you. God's just going to do what God said he's going to do. It's just that simple. But he, verse 17, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace. I love that little phrase. It's used in the book of Acts like four times, beckoning with the hand, beckoning. With 
I am Nemo. Thank you so much for the gift subs. I'm sorry. I can't believe I missed that earlier. I appreciate that. That is awesome. Hopefully you're still here. Yeah, it looks like you are. Uh, Ty is wife number two. Okay, there we go. Yeah, thank you so much. With a hand. And so they're, they're getting so emotionally driven. They're so excited. <gasps> Woo! It's Peter. It worked. We can't believe it. He's like, quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. He's beckoning with them to hold their peace. He's like, no, 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 not yet. Let me get inside. He's such a showboater. <laughs> Put some coffee on. Calm down a little bit. Let me get up in the house. Then you scream. These people are going to be looking for me in a bit. He beckoned with a hand. Uh-uh. No more. Not now. Hold your peace. Shut up. <laughs> so he beckoned with a hand to hold their peace, and he declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. Because he knew this would motivate them. He knew this would equip them. This would disciple them. This would encourage them. And he departed personally and went into another place. Now, we don't have time to pick up the remainder of the story. Just for time's sake, contextually, go back and read it. Herod finds out about it the next morning. He's livid. He is hot. He even kills the soldiers that let him out. Oh, you're going to sleep on my watch? Pow, pow. He killed them all. It used to be a different world back in the day, right? Mad, upset. He's like, where's this man at? And they're like, well, we'll be honest with you. We have no idea how he got out. Here's the chains. Here's the outfit. Here's them little orange shoes and the whole deal. Little orange shoes? The gates open. We have no idea how this man, everybody else is fine. We have no idea how this man got out. He gets mad, starts killing him. Well, then Herod gets a little big for his britches. Goes to the next town. We ain't got time to deal with it. He sits up on this throne of deception and deceitfulness. And the Bible says that he did not give glory to God. He worshipped himself. He was a blasphemer. You know what the Bible says? The Spirit of God killed him. Pow! Chopped him right up. Okay, I don't remember that part of the story, but it has been a while since I've read it. Killed him dead. And the Bible says, I love this, and the worms ate him up. I don't know what that cat been eating. It's like... Ehud in the Old Testament. Remember Ehud? He walked in and he got that dagger stuck into him. And the Bible says, and the dirt came out. Okay. I, I wish that he would get to some overarching point. It's like he's just reciting Bible stories or whatever. Doesn't everybody know these already? I don't know what these people in the Bible were eating. The, the point is not that they were eating weird stuff. It's that God made these mi miraculous things take place. Did he miss the point completely? But when worms and dirt start coming up out of your belly, you, you nasty is what you are. You, you perverted. Uh, no, it had nothing to do. See, this is what he does. He draws the wrong message. The message is not that they were eating weird stuff or that they were perverse or whatever. The message is that God made this happen to them. Out of vengeance or wrath or whatever. But God was showing. This is why that's important. God was showing the church across the nations. My church is on the rise in the midst of strict persecution. And when you touch the apple of my eye, I'll take care of you on your throne of lies. And there's his overarching point. He finally got to it. He believes that... This verse applies to today and that the church is going to be persecuted. And when the church is persecuted by the government, that is when the end will come. Because the, the persecution will be for a purpose. The purpose of the persecution will be to make people feel hated so that they lock deeper into their positions. Because that's what happens. When you feel persecuted, you lock deeper into your positions. So Greg Locke is trying to make his audience believe that they are persecuted to lock them deeper into their positions and force them um, and force the end to come. Basically, this is what he said in the book that I've been reading of his recently. This means war. We will not surrender through silence. That's the whole premise of the entire book. It shouldn't have been the title shouldn't have been. This means war. It should have been. Why are we so persecuted? Honestly, that's all he talks about through the entire thing. Absolutely nuts. And actually, we're on our last chapter in this book, so we're almost done with it. By the time you see this, 
the entire book will have been uploaded to my Telltale Reads channel, so you should go give it a listen. It's pretty crazy. But anyway, yeah, Greg Locke, man. Something off about this guy. I'm telling you. All right, looks like I've finished Mario Bros. Or Super Mario World, so let's, uh, let's play Smash Bros. while we watch the rest of this Locke video. Full of my eye, I'll take care of you on your throne of lies. And God cut the king down to size. And guess what happened? The Bible what happened? Well, clearly says in the next verse, I don't have time to look and preach on it, but in verse 24, it says, after this happened, but the word of God grew and multiplied. I bet it did. He took care of Herod. See, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about right there. Greg Locke believes when you face persecution, the church grows. And that is why he wants his people to believe that they're so deeply persecuted. If they believe they're persecuted, the church will grow. That is his whole goal, growing the church by making people believe that they're persecuted. It took care of the church in the midst of persecution. People were dying for their faith. People being, being fed to lions, being stabbed, being thrown off of temples, being beat up, bruised, bullet into a corner, silenced, lied about, mocked, ridiculed, rebelled against, ripped in half. And God said, let me show you what I think about people that mess with my kids. And guess what? Herod and the Roman Empire is no longer. And the church is still rocking on just fine 2,000 years later. The church is doing just fine. Persecution will not stop the body of Christ. No, he believes persecution will grow the body of Christ, which is why he talks about it constantly. But it will spiritually and righteously motivate the body of Christ. There you go. Of Christ. So this morning I was in my office and I had 50, 11 things that I wanted to say today, none of which I got to. Because for some reason this, this passage just, just popped out. It, it's, not even, it's not even remotely what I intended on preaching. Some Sundays I'm more distracted than others just because, you know, I, I got a lot of things to do. And I had a, a cool little wedding this morning. Nick and Danielle, give them a hand. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? I married them this morning at 9 o'clock. But I've, I've had a lot on my mind and just, you know, sleep's been off and on. My wife hasn't been feeling good. She's got a head cold and, you know, just all, all the things. We sure it's not COVID? Things in the house. I've been traveling a lot and just, I've just, I, I feel like I've been distracted a lot i feel like i've been disconnected from from myself a little bit right and so i just had all these things all these texts i had like 15 sermons i wanted to preach this morning <laughs> ended up preaching a few of them i guess but i just i said you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna leave and at like 9 30 I, I, I never leave right i'm always in the office about like 8 8 15 8 30 on sunday mornings and uh, but just you know, i could hear the band practicing and you know people were in and out of the office and i could see all the cars coming in it was just to me it was just it was sensory overload so I called my wife. I said, I'm going to go to Duncan. So I got in the car and went to Duncan, right? 9.30 in the morning. Duncan. Oh, my God. He's had some bad experiences with Duncan, actually. July 2020, he got into it with the Duncan Donuts employee, the Duncan Donuts that he goes to apparently every morning. I don't know. That's a lot of money to spend on donuts over the course of your life. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, he got into it because the manager wanted him to wear a mask because there was a mask mandate in his area at the time. And he absolutely lost his mind. And he was like, no, I ain't wearing a mask. And this is not communist China and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's one of his most famous clips. It's one of them that got him really famous. So anyway, I guess he buried the hatchet with old Dunkin Donuts and decided to, you know, go there again. You know, that's an hour before church. If you're doing the math. Got my coffee and got over on Tate Lane. You know, I like that little one road, one lane road thing I'm going to do. Does he ever preach what he says he's going to? Not really. No, he doesn't. That Masonic Lodge creeps me out, but nonetheless, <laughs> other than that, there's a little spot over there that I can, <clears throat> I, I can pull off. I pull off and just kind of park there. It's a pretty busy road. You'd be shocked. And I don't know. I just, I didn't have a Bible opened. Nothing. I mean, it's, by this time, it's, it's 9.50, right? It's 9.45, 9.50, 9.55, minutes before church starts. And I got all these things in my mind that I want to say, all these texts I want to preach on, all this stuff I want to teach on. And, and uh, 
I just reached over and I just opened my Bible. Plopped it right open. I took about three or four turns of a page. And just out of nowhere, that one little phrase of him being on the door, knocking when the Dude, I am sucking at, at Smash right now. Oh, my God. Answer had already been given. He was the answer. That's all I saw. I sent text to sent Nicole a text and the team back there. Okay, change plans. Here's what I'm preaching on. See, once again, the, the dude does not ever preach what he says he's going to, pretty much. So it was as fresh to me today as it is to you. I mean, I, like, read through it while I preached on it. Okay. So I'm just telling you, I, I'm doing all these little cute sermons. Little three points in a poem. You mean you didn't study that for hours? No, he was still on the porch knocking 2,000 years ago, and he's still on the porch knocking now, right? The, the story didn't change. Okay, now he's just tooting his own horn. Now he's just making it out like he's really cool, and he knows what he's doing, and he can preach on things without preparing for it or anything. Why would you be proud of something like that? You should most definitely... Be prepared. Like, do you have any idea how much prep work I do for, like, my podcast and my videos and stuff? Oh, my God. I spend literal hours. Probably, I, at least, for every video that you watch of mine, except for on the Unfiltered channel, there's at least three hours of prep work that goes into it for every hour. Like, so much prep work goes into this. And he's, like, proud of not prepping. It's just weird. It's a weird thing to be proud of, seems to me. <laughs> it's not like the story changed. The chick's name was still Rhoda. It wasn't Rhonda then and Rhoda now. No, it's always been Rhoda, right? And so I thought, all right, Lord, let's just get up. Just wing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just let the Word speak. Just let the Word do the work. Did he just call it the Holy Bitch? I think that's what he just said. Or he started to. Is it just me? Let's step back and listen again. And so I thought, all right, Lord, let's just get up. Just wing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just let the Word speak. Just let the Word do the work. I just can't get away from the fact that we have been so lulled to sleep in the American church, which we always say is far too American, not enough church, that we, we're just not looking for what's around the corner, and it is around the corner. Yeah, they've been saying that for 2,000 years. I'm sorry. I need a little evidence before I believe it anymore. I'm telling you, this is a plan that is unfolding before our eyes at a rate of speed that is something you can barely even fathom. They were saying that in 1843, or 1842. They said the end would be here in 1843, so I'm sorry. I just need a little more than I believe it. I just need more than that to think the end will be here any five seconds, seriously. It's being laid out in every public school. It's being laid out in, in every... Senate and House and Congress meeting and every, every church, every government facility, every mainstream and not so mainstream media, it's just being set up. We're watching it happen. The statue is being built before our very eyes. And we come to church and you know we have our cute little sermons and sing our little songs and do our baptismal celebration and we go home. That's not going to get us through the next level. It doesn't get us through the next round. Because the next round is coming. I don't know what it looks like. Don't care. Don't care. I've done enough Facebook rants. You know who I am. I've preached enough political ranting sermons. You know where I stand? Yeah, but I need more. That's why I'm here. I want to hear you act like a nutter butter. It's so entertaining to me. We don't have to rehash all that. We do. We do have to rehash it. I don't know. I don't remember. Tell me again. But I'm telling you, it's quiet in here. You know why it's quiet. Because you have the microphone and you're not speaking very often? Because some of you aren't going to be willing to go against the pressure that you're going to feel for standing for righteousness. Don't make up your mind then because then you're already done. Make up your mind now. You're either going to stand or you're not. It's not going to get easier. I'm sorry, it's not. 
You can stay up all night on Rumble and Telegram. The the two most far right social media networks, Rumble and Telegram, they are as far right as they as it gets. Honestly, they're insane. And hear these promises of these people that tell you it's about to get better. It's not. I've been in every room with every one of them. It's not getting better. He really wants people to believe the end is here and they're about to be persecuted terribly and sent to jail and everything. Desperately. Stop this date setting nonsense. I'm sick of it around our church. I'm sick of it. This gonna happen on the 24th. This Oh, I love it. He mentioned the 24th. Okay, there is this Facebook meme that was going around. Actually, I talked about this not too long ago. There's this faction of QAnon, among other groups, that were claiming that the end would be here on September 24th. Okay, now this video that he put out came out October 2nd, so I guess he's referring to that now. Funny that he didn't mention the fact that the 24th wasn't going to be the rapture, before the or yeah before the 24th right he waited until after the 24th to say that the end wasn't going to be the 24th how about that it's convenient right well anyways the 24th was this big rapture date that like all bunch of QAnon Christians were talking about and it somehow relates to Israel being rebuilt in 1948 and a certain length of a generation and blah 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 i don't know exactly why they believe the rapture is coming uh, something about seven years passing or jacob's trouble i don't know anyway it's fascinating that he chose october 2nd to say the 24th was a ridiculous date to pick for the rapture rather than the 23rd funny huh this gonna happen on the 26th. It's gonna happen according to the way the Bible says it happens, and some of you aren't gonna be ready on it because you set too many stupid dates. Quit! Stop! Uh, it, they weren't setting the dates. They were just listening to what you know Facebook preachers were saying. Uh, which, by the way, Greg Locke is a Facebook preacher. So, just saying, he's just not one that set the 24th as a date. That's all. Stop. Okay. I already know what decisions made for 2024. I'm not talking about who's in. I'm talking about who's running. I don't care. Okay. I don't care. I mean, you, you, people think I'm playing, but we, we get through 2024. I, 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 I throw my hat in the ring. I'm telling you, I'm sick of this whole crap fest that we call America right now. But stop all this stuff. October 6th is going to be a miracle day. Every day is a miracle day. I haven't heard anything about October 6th. Is there something that I like, am missing? I follow this stuff pretty closely. Stop. The economy's not getting better in two days from now. It's going to get bad. Real bad. It's going to get, it's got to, it's got to get worse. That's weird because he said that not too long ago and it, the, the economy isn't getting better. It's getting worse. And interestingly enough, it actually got better from when he said that. Weird, huh? I thought he said it was going to get worse, not better. And here we are with the economy better now than it was when he said that. So which is it? Is the economy getting better or worse? Because we have irrefu irrefutable proof now that what Greg Locke said is a lie, is incorrect is BS. Which is it? Greg Locke has a bad habit of making piss poor predictions and then pretending he didn't when they fall flat. He didn't say in the last days things get gooder and gooder. Uh, you mean better and better? He said they get worse and worse and evil men and seducers get worse and worse and the love of many will wax cold. He, talk about, he, or he talked about the waxing cold thing in his book, too. The idea is, all right, it, it's kind of like when a candle dries, the wax grows cold. That's what he was claiming is going to happen in the end to people or whatever. It's not going to get better overnight. Stop it. Just quit. Quit. I used to hear people in school say that all the time. Quit. The only thing that's going to make it better is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Your mom could make it better. That God already preemptively predicted and prophesied that all this was going to happen. So don't sit around with your hands folded, waiting to get snatched up out of here. The Bible says, occupy until he comes. You know what that means? That means until he shows up, you do something. Until he shows up, you keep praying. Until he shows up, you keep preaching. Until he shows up, you keep worshiping. Until he shows up, you keep prophesying. Until he shows up, you keep winning people to cry. You keep on. You occupy. You don't sit around on your hands and do nothing. You work till he gets here. You worship till he gets here. You war till he gets here. You walk till he gets here. You got to do something. Occupy till he comes. This is a motivational speech, trying to get people wound up into a blood frenzy. Whoop, <laughs> it's freezing on me. Well, that's basically the end of the video anyways. Hang on, let's see. Yeah, that was pretty much the end. Then he switches it over to his wife, who does, who does like a 20-minute long prayer, which is unbiblical for all kinds of reasons. But yeah, that's Greg Locke. That's Greg Locke. That's the dude. The dude is... Just unglued from reality at this point. It's insane. Absolutely insane. Deeply entertaining, though, if I have to say. Let me know what you think of this in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist.